what's up? Goldie here. And I'm going to be going over the kind of mid-range seven-game main slate that we have here on um, uh, Monday, June 19. So I hope everybody had a good weekend if you played or if you didn't. Um, excited to get back into a, another full week of baseball here, about two and a half months into the season now. Um, so usual sort of spiel at the top. We've got projections and ownership loaded. Um, we're going to try and keep this short today. Short-ish. I'll still probably yeah for an hour. But um, some attackable spots. Really interesting tournament slate. Uh, I think a lot of the guys that have are, are seeing a lot of ownership right now. Um, you know, we got some noise, right? Big standard deviations in some of this ownership. So we'll see how this fleshes out through the rest of the day. Keep an eye on, out for changes, of course. We'll be pushing updates regularly. Um, I think, it, you know, all of these guys are attackable in one way or another. I don't think there is a stone lock smash. Um in any one of these particular matchups, uh, perhaps, eh, I mean, sure, there's a, there's a couple of spots you know, that I personally like a, a little bit better than others, um, but I don't think we have to necessarily uh, focus in on one or two arms and just like, you just click it in, you know what I mean? Because in projection wise, and really kind of in ownership, it's, it's reflecting this, um, Everybody above, you know, above Waka, I guess, is effectively negligible, right? In terms of projection, we're talking one, maybe a two-point delta between these guys. And for the most part, for starting pitchers, a one and two-point projection delta, not obviously not when we're crunching teams, but in terms of uh, distributions, it's mostly negligible. One and two points here. So that's kind of why we have to dig into the fundamentals and and decide what we like more um, price tag spots ownership right that's when we jump over to this column and see if we can exploit some stuff here and I think we may be able to so let's just get into it and start with the um, start with the Cubs and the Pirates Smiley on the mound 6500 this is a fine price for Smiley as a matter of fact now I've been looking to get short on Smiley for quite a while now um, and, I mean, it, it's starting to work out, I guess, over his last five starts. They've really not been um, all that excellent. He's struggling with the whip stuff, uh, as is kind of, you know, has been expected, right? He's drifting downward now. He's about three ticks below league average for a starting pitcher. Um, and his last four starts against Pittsburgh, Okay, in his last start, they get him again here. The Angels, San Diego, and Cincinnati. Some difficult matchups, sure. Um, but he's been struggling with the strikeout stuff. Just two, four, four, and four strikeouts against Cincinnati, San Diego, Angels, and Pittsburgh. He's still going deep-ish into games, you know, five innings or so in those starts. But the suppression really hasn't been there. When he gives up some runs, he's starting to struggle a little bit to make that up in terms of DFS points right uh, because he's only got the 20 percent strikeout rate giving up some pop here really to both sides 150 x iso so perhaps running a little bit cold um in the realized metrics right but a 297 woba is a good number right 240 xba pretty good number and the 150 x iso pretty damn good number overall the hard contact looks fine where we really like playing Drew Smiley is so, well, certainly at a 6500 price tag. We're buying seasonal lows on him. He's got upside at this price. We like playing him, um, you know, against, well, number one, left-handed heavy teams, right? He's historically he's given up a little bit of pop. Pittsburgh's not going to be a left-handed heavy team. They're going to platoon against him. And we like teams that will hit it in the air, at least from the right side of the plate, against him as well because he's such a, a heavy fly ball pitcher. He induces a lot of soft contact and very weak fly balls to the right side. And that's because of this curveball. He mains this curveball and he throws it over 50% of the time. This is the highest usage of a curveball in, in baseball for a starting pitcher. That includes Adam Wainwright. That includes Charlie Morton, who both main their curveball as well. 
Now, the difference between Wainwright and Morton and Drew Smiley here is that those other two guys, they have five and six pitches that they can go to work with. And unfortunately for Drew Smiley, I mean, this curveball value is starting to drop off the table here, so to speak. Um, it, it was eking out value-wise two and three outs above the field earlier in the season. But now that uh, we're kind of getting into it here, we got a big sample on him, 14 full starts and nearly 80 innings. Uh, the curveball value is really starting to come off quite a bit. And since he throws as his main fastball, just a two-seamer here, he does have the cutter, of course, and that's still keeping him out of a lot of trouble, inducing uh, some good, a good bit of soft contact also. The two-seamer, however, has never been a good pitch, and I ran about this about a, a sinker all the time. It's not a good pitch to the opposite side of the plate, um, and it's really only a good pitch to same-handed hitters, right? If you can really bury it down in the strike zone. And we don't necessarily see that a lot with Smiley, right? So he's overall just a, a pretty soft tossing lefty, 91, 93. And he's got pretty much just one good pitch. The cutter, he's going to mostly just throw to the right hander. So um, what that means here for Pittsburgh overall, they're, I mean, just a, a pretty average offense against left-handed pitching better than they are against righties, of course, um, because most of their better hitters are hitting from the right side here. Kutch, Connor Joe, Brian Hayes, Rody Castro hits lefties very well, et cetera, et cetera. Of course, Brian Reynolds, you know, hitting from both sides. Um, they're not going to strike out a lot, and I think this puts Pittsburgh in play once again. They did just see him in his last start, right, Drew Smiley. So, And they put up five earned against him in, in a full six innings, Smiley sprayed nine hits here and only struck out the four. So um, I think when we when an offense gets a starting pitcher twice in a week, you just kind of have to default and s side with the offense there, right? Um, especially when the starting pitcher doesn't have all that uh, overwhelming, overwhelming of an arsenal here, right? And just a two-seamer curveball um, with the cutter sure, it's... You need a little bit more here because the two-seamer is very likely to give up value. And similar to like a Charlie Morton yesterday, if you don't have this curveball, you could very well start walking people and then give up a lot of contact if your your main pitch isn't – if you're just not feeling it that day, right? Since he doesn't throw the cutter all that often, he's not going to be comfortable going to this pitch if the curveball is bad and then all of a sudden the – you know, the two-seamer is, is normally bad, so it's unlikely to be excellent, right? And now all of a sudden you're in a pretty big hole because you don't have anything you can go to the, go to work with. Um, and that's kind of what happened in his last start. So can we count on that to happen again? Not necessarily because Drew Smiley is a, a pretty serviceable arm, right? And I think 6,500 here and 10% ownership mostly puts him in play against Pirates. But I think offense is in play here from Pittsburgh as well. Like I said, you just kind of have to side with the offense when they get a starting arm. And it back-to-back -back starts for them twice in a week. So they have good numbers against lefties overall this season. They create because they still have guys that run. And they've got guys with a good bit of pop here. Kutch, Reynolds, Connor Joe from the right side in particular. Cabrian Hayes has been really good recently. He hits a lot of ground balls, right? So these ground ball hitters like Connor Joe and Kutch and, and Cabrian Hayes are a pretty damn good batted ball matchup here getting so many fly balls against Drew Smiley. So it's the soft contact that really puts him in play, and I don't really want anybody that's going to make a lot of soft contact necessarily. Uh, so I think if I had to choose, it'd probably be a short stack of the Pirates here with Kutch, Connor Joe, Anna Cabrian Hayes, or a Rody Castro, something like that, who hits lefties well. Uh, they did just call up a very high upside prospect for them. Drafted just a couple of years ago in Henry Davis. He's a stone min behind the plate. You can play that also. Um, may take a little bit. He's He's got very limited um, service time at, at the AAA level, right? He's, what, 14, 15 games or something like that um, in 75 PAs or something. Not a lot of work there, so they're calling him up essentially from AA, but... Um, this is a very high upside prospect for them. So you can play him and, and get in there at the, you know, in what's a, 
attackable spot here against Drew Smiley. But I, I do think both sides are in play. Osvaldo Bito on the other side for the Pirates. 5,600 for him. I'm not sure I want to get after this. He was also in the in the same start as, you know, having seen them, what, a, a week ago, five days ago, right? This is back-to-back starts for the Cubs against Bito also. Um and I think I'd like to just go right back to the Cubs. He only gave up one run, but he walked three batters and only went four innings. So I think what, you know, it would play more into the Cubs here, you know, their strengths, seeing Beto for a second time. They've got a little bit more of a book on him now. Um, you know, he came up, I believe, just from double A. So I think I would like to get to some of the Cubs here as well. I think they're all in play. They might be a little bit off the board here. Um, popping in value though, because Meg Talkman is still 2,500 and leading off. Say a Suzuki at 38, it's a fine play. Hap is fine. You got to pay for Dansby and Nico Horner and Cody Bellinger, Chris Morrell, but plenty of ways to make cheaper stacks happen for, uh, with you for the Cubs. It's warm in Pittsburgh and the ballpark's going to play up power and offense a little bit more when it's warm. It's actually, I believe the, yeah, right there with Minnesota, um, two warmest spots of the day. So weather-wise, if you want to target that, I think this is in play. Offense is certainly, and I'm probably going to mostly stay off of pitching, but I do kind of like uh, Drew Smiley here at 65. And the projection is fine for him. It's not overly impressive, but the ownership is is attractive. I think there's a little bit of upside at that figure and an exploitable number. So um, mostly offense here, but a little bit of Drew Smiley. I think a lot of guys are really in play here. All right, Colorado and the Reds. we got some weather here we're going to have to keep an eye on. Uh, the Reds are going to be the most popular team of the day for sure because they get Austin Gomber, uh, 5,100. I, I still just don't think we could play this. He pitches to way too much contact, and he can't throw a pass anybody. Similar to, well, really every one of the Rockies starting pitchers and their bullpen guys too. They just they don't miss bats. And we're getting to the point of the season now where um, – you know, their arsenals and what they're going to work with are, are really circulating throughout the, you know, the entirety of the majors. And, you know, teams have got a, a pretty damn good book on all these guys. They know what they're, they're comfortable themselves, right, offensively. They've been playing for two and a half months. They're into the swing of things of the season. They, they've got their travel schedules. You know, everybody's all comfortable now at this point in the year. And if you're not going to be missing bats, right, you're, the, the offense is on the other side. Like, you're just going to struggle to limit production. You have to be able to throw it by people um, or sequence very well, get ground balls at a very high clip, et cetera, et cetera. You've got to have a lot of pitches, um, and, and you've got to locate very well, similar to like a Zach Greinke. Like he's, he doesn't strike anybody out, but he's got five and six pitches that he goes to work with, and he locates, right? He stays on the edges. He doesn't get over the middle of the plate all that often. That is not the case here with a guy like Austin, ba- Austin Gomber at a very low strikeout rate himself. Now he does throw strike one. That's fine. But he doesn't have any chase in him. He's got just an 8% swinging strike rate, 24% CSW. Low strand rate here, but he's pitching to way too much contact. If you're li- if you're looking for some regression in, in the suppression metrics, it's probably going to come in the strand rate. He's got a 720, 730 ERA with an XFIP of 510. So, yeah, we're looking for a lot of positive regression for Gomber, but we struggle to find positive regression for arms that can't, induce outs right and he really cannot do that he pitches to way too much contact i mean these are huge numbers here short sample against the lefties but a 390 average allowed that's a big number that's worrisome 291 average to the righties and not a short sample right 381 woba with a 244 iso in aggregate has a 251 x iso to both sides with a 403 x woba it i mean anything north of 350 we start to take notice of and anything north of 400 it's like yeah stack the offense on the other side pretty much with impunity because he gives up hard contact he gives up barrels at a full 10 percent he gives up balls in the air and on a line I mean there's just nothing here that I'm attracted to in the arsenal outside of a low strand rate but if he can't throw it past people you're not going to be able to strand anybody right so um nine percent walk rate like this would have to be three or four percent for me to 
think that there would be any sort of strand rate regression coming uh, or anything like this. It's just not there for Gomber. He, he just doesn't have the raw whiff stuff to get out of some of these holes. He pitches to too much contact. So it's definitely the Reds. And this is one of the hottest teams in baseball right now. They've run, they've won, what, eight in a row? They just swept Houston in Houston. Um, and we talked about this. Their offenses, these numbers for them are going to continue to tick up. They may very well get Joey Votto back uh, tonight or sometime in this series. They might sit him because Freeland and Gomer are likely to go, I believe, in this series for the Rockies. Um, so we'll see. And he's been awful in his rehab starts. But overall, really strong hit tool uh, against righties, against lefties here for a lot of these young kids. McLean, India, India's still young. Ellie De La Cruz, of course, Spencer Steer, Tyler Stevenson, Nick Senzel. Not necessarily young anymore, but if he could stay healthy, I mean, all of these guys have a lot of upside. Really, really strong hit tools for them. And you're going to see these numbers continue to tick up. The power is going to continue to climb. Right, Johnny India, if he's starting to hit the baseball over the wall, um, I mean, that's a, a stone lock to play at, at very cheap price tags. He's 4,600 today. This is an incredible play. Um, Ellie De La Cruz, of course, he hits the ball probably the hardest of anybody in baseball outside of like Jordan Alvarez or Shohei or something like that. Um, maybe an Aaron Judge. Right, Spencer Steer has plenty of upside against lefties, of course. Matt McClain, definitely. Speed. Good hit tool there as well. Tyler Stevenson, this is a high upside spot for him to realize a little bit of the power. And same with Senzel and even Stuart Fairchild down at the bottom of the lineup. So very high upside spot for the Reds here. You just got to worry about ownership, number one, and weather. Um, Keep an eye out for that coming as we get closer into lock. That's really the only stuff we're going to have to balance here with the Reds. But uh, they're definitely the top value stack of the day. They're... And they're, they're going to be the most popular, so you got to balance that. Um, but nothing wrong fundamentally. I want to go after Gomber for sure. Um, and I, I don't see any reason why the Reds can't uh, can't capitalize on this. Brandon Williamson on the mound for Cincinnati. 5500 for him. Now, he debuted against the Rockies, as a matter of fact. So it's the second time they're seeing him this year. Um, he had a, a pretty good outing. Went, I believe, five and two-thirds or something. Struck out six. Uh, yeah. And in his first outing at Coors Field. Now, ever since then, the strikeout stuff has really kind of fallen off a cliff. Um, he doesn't, He's not missing any bats either. 16% K rate for him. Kansas City in his last start. Then he got the Dodgers, Milwaukee, the Cubs, and St. Louis. So a couple of difficult strikeout matchups there. But for the most part, should still be realizing a little bit higher number than 16% here. So I think that puts the Rockies in play. Because they're overall absolutely atrocious against left-handed pitching. Because they, they strike out a 26% clip. Now, Williamson's not necessarily going to do that here. But at 5,500, I think it puts him in play. Because the Rockies are so bad. And they're also likely to be missing Ezekiel Tovar tonight. Because he got pulled yesterday to go on what's very likely to be the paternity list. His wife went into labor. So... Likely to be missing him at the top of the lineup, and he's been one of their better hitters over the last month in terms of just raw average. He's coming into his own, and he's not going to be there. So um, all these other guys, you know, they're, they're going to go very right-handed heavy. Likely the only two lefties they'll have in the lineup are going to be Ryan McMahon, who's been destroying everybody, righties and lefties, really for the last month or so, um, and Nolan Jones, who obviously we want against righties, most often, but uh, he's been fine too. So those are the only two lefties they'll have in the lineup, which means Williamson's probably going to struggle, at least with the platoon. For the most part here, he's not going to throw it past anybody, really to either side of the plate. Um, And we've got some underlying worries here for Williamson as well, as the league also gets more of a book on him. 14% barrel rate's not good. 10% barrel rate, or uh, walk rate rather, not good. Combine that with the 16% walk rate, uh, you know, we we got some some worries here. Mostly right in line, suppression-wise, with uh, batted ball metrics, um, you know, what they're suggesting. Buck 40 whip, not all that attractive, and a good bit of hard contact here, mostly to the right side. Short sample against the lefties and very few hitters, but 
mean, you've seen 112 hitters here against the righties this year. 250 average allowed, 373 Woban, a 300 ISO with a 269 aggregate X ISO. Fly balls here in a small ballpark and hard contact on the barrel at 36, 37% with line drives at 23%. That's playing into the Rockies' strength here because they still make line drive contact at 23.5%. Now, they're not necessarily going to hit the ball out all that regularly. Because there's only a couple of guys here with over-the-wall power. That's McMahon, that's Elias Diaz, and that's Elleris Montero. He's got pop. His main problem is strikeouts. And that's not really going to happen here for Williamson. Um, so I like the Rockies here, too. And they're not going to be nearly as popular as Cincinnati. But I think Brandon Williamson is attackable, certainly. The price tag here at 55 puts him in play because we're getting him back down at, I mean, even lower than where he debuted at 5,700. And the ownership puts him in play for sure. And the matchup definitely puts him in play. However, I think fundamentally I'd have to side with Colorado and just go after uh, Williamson here with like a, a Ryan McMahon. You can play him against pretty much everybody in baseball right now. Elias Diaz, you can play Alf behind the plate if you can't get to um, Elias Diaz. And Elleris Montero, or, or really Brent Doyle, Coco Montez. These guys are all playable. Grichik is it high average hit tool. Uh, Jerry Profar, he's got on-base skills a little bit, but really not a lot of power. The the ballpark here is really going to play up um, offense and over-the-wall power for them because the dimensions are a hell of a lot smaller than Coors Field. So high upside spot for the Rockies as well as Cincinnati here. Okay, let's move on to Boston and Minnesota. Uh, so much for trying to keep it short here. Uh, James Paxton, I like this, 9,300. The Twins are awful against left-handed pitching, too. 20, 28% strikeout rate in aggregate, 600 PAs this season. Now, they're going to go right-handed heavy tonight. They did just get Byron Buxton back, but he strikes out at a 25 and 30% clip against pretty much everybody. Um, and he's probably going to get hurt walking up the stairs onto the field. Donnie Solano doesn't really strike out a lot. Carlos Correa, not so much. Everybody down at the bottom of the of the lineup, though, they're going to whiff. And I think it's an attackable spot for Paxton. However, going up against a you know, what's very likely to be six or seven strong uh, right-handed hitters here with Paxton, he's susceptible to hard contact and getting on the barrel a little bit uh, to the right side, right? 10% aggregate barrel rate here in his six starts this season, 42.5% hard contact with 075 ground balls per fly ball. Uh, that's that's concerning here. It's only translated so far into a 144 ISO. In aggregate, right, 170X ISO. And that's probably right in line with where he should be, 150, 160 to the righties. But um, given... A quite outsized strikeout rate to the right side of the plate, 37.5%. This is a huge figure. And we still have a short-ish sample, 100 hitters. It's not terribly short, but it's still only 100 hitters for Paxton against righties this year. He's been very, very good. Don't get me wrong. He's only had the one bad start against the Angels uh, where they strike out much less, and they create a hell of a lot more than do the Twins. So I think Paxton is certainly in play. 9,300, I like the ownership here relative to a lot of the other guys. I think this is one of the numbers we might be able to eke out some leverage on the field because you're going to see Scherzer with more ownership than this. You're even seeing Pablo Lopez on the other side with a little bit more ownership than this. Um, but Paxton has the best strikeout raw strikeout matchup on the day for anybody. He's got K-stuff. And the Twins whiff. So, yeah, sign me up. Let's do it. Uh, even if he does give up a little bit of production, he's still very likely to be able to make some of that up with the strikeout stuff, even though it's probably not going to be 37.5% as we move forward. Um, if you do want to play some Twins, yeah, get some guys that make very hard contact and, and get the baseball on a line against left-handers, and that's Carlos Correa again. Kyle Farmer, sure. Royce Lewis is fine as well. Uh, either of the catchers are okay, not jacked about a 2,900 for Ryan Jeffers necessarily, um, You know, but a Christian Vasquez is super cheap. I am probably just going to leave Buxton on the shelf unless I'm stacking the Twins because I think he stinks. Um, strikes out too much and like can't play, like can't stay on the field, doesn't steal anymore. 5,600, that's, that's expensive in this matchup. So, not super jacked about playing the Twins. I'd rather side with Paxton here, I think. Um, 
you know, we got six starts on him, and I'm starting to kind of come off of the wait and see mode that I've been in him or been in with him. Uh, but I think some pieces here are definitely in play because of this very, very high hard contact figure and really worrisome line drive and fly ball rates that he's given up to the righties here. This ISO number should come up if those numbers persist. Uh, everything else, you know, mostly pretty okay here for Paxton. He looks very, very good. Uh, good velo. It's the highest it's been in several years for Paxton now that he's healthy again. He looks he looks really strong. Uh, Pablo Lopez going for the Twins, 91. I think this is fine, too. 24% ownership. Like I said, I'd rather play Paxton. Um, but I think both of these guys are very much in play. Pablo's numbers against pretty much everybody have been excellent this season. He brought the sweeper in, right? And the changeup's been super equitable also. Break even four seamer, but we're okay with that when he's got plus secondary stuff. And that's what he has in the sweeper and the change. Last couple starts for Pablo have been much better than the previous, you know, several, where he went through a little bit of a funk, wasn't really striking out guys, pitching to too much contact. Um, but against Tampa, he was really, really good. Seven innings, six Ks, gave up just the one. And three earned against Milwaukee in his last start, went six innings, struck out nine. Right, So I think Pablo probably starting to figure it out here a little bit, and I'm okay playing and getting some exposure to him tonight, even against Boston, which is a pretty difficult lineup to go after. Overall, they're just average, right? We like playing them earlier in the season where they were realizing a lot of the power, um, but they haven't been recently, and Verdugo really regressing back to his normal ways and being just a contact hitter. 4700 he's kind of expensive here. Justin Turner's not going to strike out. Obviously, you can play Devers against everybody in baseball. That's fine. Adam Duvall, though, do we really want him? He's going to strike out a good bit in this particular matchup against Pablo. 34% strikeout rate against right-handers, and Duvall strikes out against righties, definitely. Masataki Yoshi is not going to. He's 5500 though. Um, so in this matchup, I think the price tags are probably a little bit high for Boston for me to get overly thrilled with. They're just an average offense. They don't steal. They don't create outside of maybe a guy here or there, um, they got to hit the baseball out. And, you know, this ballpark's really going to kind of play down right-handed power a little bit. But as we mentioned at the outset in the Pittsburgh game, it is very warm. It's nearly 90 degrees here in Minnesota tonight. So that's going to play a power as well. And one of the better hitting environments of the night, you can get to offense, even though both of these pitchers are very strong and very much in play. This is just a seven-game slate. And you can play a lot of different spots here and if you want to go after and try and get leverage on both of these pitchers yeah i mean i'm totally on board with it play some twins where they're well priced play some red Sox where they're well priced or, or rafi devers i mean whatever doesn't matter um i think that's okay because they're gonna be totally off the board nobody's gonna be playing boston nobody's gonna be playing the twins so go ahead they're they're perfectly fine in tournaments and you know, I'm going to get exposure definitely to, to both of these guys. Um, but like I said, I think I'd prefer Paxson at this point. But nothing really wrong fundamentally with Pablo either. I'm actually looking for the kind of the strand right here to kind of tick up a little bit and see some positive regression for him in the suppression. 420, 430 ERA with expected metrics, uh, you know, about three quarters of a run lower than that. So uh, overall, like a, a good bit of pitching here in this game mostly, um, but a couple offensive pieces where they're well-priced are certainly playable too. All right, Andrew Heaney on the mound against the White Sox, 7,500 for him um, in Chicago tonight. Now, there should be a little bit of a wind. We got to keep an eye out for pop-ups or, you know, whatever. Should mostly be okay, I think. So keep an eye out for that. 7,500 for Heaney here. We kind of know what Heaney is now at this point. Um, he, having, you know, throwing a lot more of the change being balanced here with the uh, at least a full three pitch mix that makes Heaney far more playable than he has been in the past, right? He, he's really got the hard contact under control against the right side of the plate. Still giving up pop and getting on the barrel here occasionally. So nothing's perfect yet because the changeup overall um, is still just kind of neutral value natural because the four seamer here full 60 percent of the arsenal neutral value and when the four seamer is bad right when we're on the downside of the variance with a 60 percent usage pitch the off-speed pitch when it's just a straight change is very likely to be bad as well and then you're all of a sudden working with just one pitch 
in the slider, which is also neutral value when it's at its best. So um, overall, not super impressive with Heaney. He does have the strikeout stuff, yeah. It's far lower and right at league average, though, against the right-handers. So he's far more attackable here with a, a fly ball lean at an 080, 090 ground ball to fly ball. Fine line drive rate, you know, neutral 20%. Fine hard contact rate, 32%. He's going to give up a little bit of pop, though, still, and get on the barrel sometimes uh, against right-handers. So I think with a very right-handed heavy team here in the White Sox, you can go after some Andrew Heaney. Now, I would like to get some exposure, I think, to Heaney, but I think this is a an average matchup for him because they're going to go so right-handed heavy. Very likely to have... Uh, a full nine righties in the lineup tonight. You have to keep an eye on Tim Anderson. He's dealing with a sore right shoulder, I believe. They may keep him out still. I believe they've got until today to decide whether to put them on the DL. They may. Um, they did bring up uh, Zach Remillard, who's just kind of an average sort of prospect for them. Um, mostly do, like they drafted him in like 2016, and it's taken him this long to really make his debut. He's been mostly blocked by everybody else they've had at the positions that he plays right he's kind of a, a corner infielder and they've had Juan Moncada and at least to this up to this season Jose Abreu uh, blocking those those spots so um hasn't really had much of a chance here they might play him in the middle infield because they also have Andrew Vaughn and Jake Berger who are sole corner outfielders so they might play him at like a second base or even a shortstop um Probably second base and move Elvis Andrews over to short, something like that. In any case, they're going to go very right-handed heavy tonight, and Remillard's 2,300 leading off with dual eligibility against a guy that gives up power a little bit still to the right side of the plate. So it's an upside spot, and he's very cheap. And every other righty in the lineup, including Luis Robert, who's down to 4,600 here, is very much playable. Eloy to Jake Berger, all the pop in the world against righties, excuse me, against lefties from the right side of the plate. He's 3,500. Andrew Vaughn's 3,000, right? I don't really want to go after anybody at the bottom half of the lineup with a Ben Intendi, Grandal, Frazier, or an Elvis Andrews, but they are in play as filler pieces in stacks if you get there. White Sox is going to be kind of off the board. Um, a little bit here, I think, in ownership. I think we're going to be mostly pretty balanced here today outside of the Reds and maybe, you know, Texas on the other side, who we'll get to in a sec. Uh, but it makes for a, a decent tournament stack here with the White Sox. I think Heaney is attackable because his arsenal is just break even. So uh, with a, a, an 11% walk rate here and 10% barrel rate, he's susceptible, definitely. And a lot of these pieces here, for the White Sox, they're going to be completely ignored, even if in aggregate some of them will be popular, like an Aloy, like a Luis Robert, Jake Berger, these types. Um, so I think uh, the White Sox here, even though they don't hit for a lot of power, generally, uh, they're still an okay offense against left-handed pitching, 102 WRC+, plus with a slightly elevated, at least above average, 162 ISO. I think this is a... a Playable batted ball profile against Andrew Heaney, who's really not going to wow them necessarily, just an average strikeout rate against righties. Jesse Scholten's likely to go on the mound for the White Sox, but by most accounts, this can be a bullpen game. Um, he's not stretched out at all. He threw two days ago and threw an inning, I believe. So um, he's the only one that uh, that I've seen floating around uh, name-wise that could go for the Sox. Who knows what they're going to do? Um, and who knows who would they would bring in after him very likely to just be a bullpen game for them which would normally take me off of the opposing offense but this is texas and i don't really care so let's do it um yeah, ready for this number 37 percent hard contact against right handers over 2,000 plate appearances this season this is three full percentage points higher than the next highest team on the day today um uh, on the slate today and it's like it's just out of control good this lineup is so so difficult to get through every damn one of them has like a 340 on base percentage they're so strong and i want to play texas once again 118 wrc plus highest number on the day 22 percent strikeout rate one of the lower numbers on the day 190 iso in aggregate highest number on the day Etc. Etc. Just on down. 266 average. It's not the highest number, but it's one. It's literally one point lower than the two highest teams, which are at 267, and that's the Reds, and that's uh, oh, I forget who. Um. Yeah, I, I forget the other team. In any case, 
the like every single offensive metric here for Texas against right-handers, right, is it, it just through the roof, off the charts good. So the White Sox are, are likely to throw a righty. If they throw a lefty, it doesn't really matter because they've got a hell of a lot of righties that hit lefties very well. These numbers don't change all that much. As a matter of fact, they go up, right? The WRC Plus goes up in, a, what, a 700 PA sample uh, against left-handers, right? The, the strikeout rate goes down. Uh, power comes down a little bit, but not all that much, right? 37% hard contact in aggregate, so it goes up against lefties as well. So it's an even even better spot if they th- throw some kind of lefty out there. Um, so I think offense is, is pretty much, you know, very well in play here. Heaney certainly, if you want to play like correlated teams, okay, because he's got strikeout upside. But this is a dangerous matchup for him, and I think I'd rather play some of the White Sox on the other side. Okay, Mets and Houston. Here's where we're going to see most of the ownership in the mid-range. 8,800 for Scherzer. I don't know about this. Um, this looks a little bit fishy. Like, I like Scherzer, okay, but if we were to do, you know, go through an exercise here and just look at all of these plate discipline numbers uh, and batted ball numbers, like, he's got a 4.5 ERA with a 420 XFIP, 75% strand rate, all right, whatever. 72% strike one, it's excellent. 32.5, 33% chase, it's excellent. 14% swing strike rate, excellent. But where's the called strikes, right? 27, 28% CSW is not all that impressive. 25% strikeout rate, not all that impressive, even though it is a couple ticks above average. Good walk rate, yeah, but a 10% barrel rate here, right? 89 mile an hour average exit velo, that's about league average for a starting pitcher, right? 34% hard contact rate to the left side, 35% hard contact rate to the right side. 070 ground ball to fly ball, 299 X Woba, it's fine. 185 X ISO, it's fine. 222 XBA, it's fine. But this hard contact, 2.3 homers per nine, 4% raw homer rate, that's a little bit worrisome. So if we just kind of block out the name here and we didn't know that this was Max Scherzer would be would we really be all that thrilled about paying 8800 and 30% ownership for all of these numbers against Houston? I don't know. I don't know. Seems a little outsized to me. Now, don't get me wrong, he does still have a 30% strikeout rate against the right side and they're going to have eight righties in the list tonight. But four of them don't strike out and the one lefty that they get that he's got to get through is Kyle Tucker, who hits lefty or who has right-handers exceptionally well. So I think this is kind of a worrisome spot here for Scherzer, and I would much rather pay an extra 500, get up to James Paxton in a far better strikeout matchup, because Houston only strikes out at a at league average clip here. With Mo Bone up at the top of the lineup, Josie Altuve back, Kyle Tucker, Alex Bregman, these guys don't strike out at all. Like, the Alex Bregman's got, like, a 9% strikeout rate or something just insane. So, super hard to for Scherzer to kind of get going here and get down to the bottom of the lineup where there are real strikeouts, right? The guys at the top, they make a lot of contact, and if he's going to be pitching with guys on base, it changes the at-bat. He can't just go to a lot of the, um, you know, equitable arsenal or uh, equitable points of the arsenal, when there's runners on base necessarily. So I think this is a little bit of a dangerous spot to be eating 30% ownership on Scherzer here. Um, I don't know. I think, uh, like, this is Scherzer, don't get me wrong. I love 30% Ks against a very right-handed heavy lineup, you know, and I think having some Scherzer tonight is, is certainly warranted. But do I want to eat a full 30%? I don't know. There's plenty of guys in this range I think we could play. Like, in the next game we'll talk about, you could play Merrill Kelly, you could play Pax, you could play Pablo Lopez, right? Um, you could spend a little bit more, and you could pay. You could play Hunter Brown on the other side at half the ownership. I think this is very much playable. Uh, do I want to go after Scherzer? Well, yeah, I think some of these numbers warrant that a little bit. This season, 075 ground ball to fly ball, 35% hard contact rate to the righties, 262 ISO. Right, he's got a 185 x ISO allowed. That's a big number for Scherzer. So I know we've talked about historically, it, it's been the lefties that have really gotten to him. But like, I mean, we got a 115 hitter sample now on him this year, and these numbers against righties are awful. Right, this is very much attackable despite the very high strikeout rate. So where's the changeup value? Right, where's the slider and the curveball value? 
he's just giving it up to the field here. So I think this is a really intriguing kind of shrewd tournament spot to get to a couple of Houston pieces. It value wise, they're cheap enough to play. Alex Bregman, forty six hundred. I, I think he's a pretty good third base plate here tonight. Not so much in the Jose Altuve at forty eight, but Mo Dubon is fine. Dual eligibility at thirty six hundred at the top. Kyle Tucker, of course, at five thousand. If you're playing any Houston, you're certainly not leaving off Kyle Tucker. Everybody down at the bottom half of the lineup, maybe you get to like a Yiner Diaz or something, but I don't want to play Obreu because he stinks. I don't want to play Peña because he strikes out a lot. Same thing with Jake Myers and Martin Maldonado didn't have any pop. So um, mostly a, a short little three-man up at the top, but I think that's a damn good little leverage stack to go after some 30% ownership on Scherzer. I think it's a bit too high now because he's got to prove to me that like we don't have, like this is the old Scherzer, right? That this is, that we don't have these, these underlying problems here, but this is a lot of hard contact, a lot of fly balls still, and he's given up a lot of power to the right side of the plate. This is a huge number. 262 ISO is very worrisome with a 280 average allowed. It's not like that's noisy, right? That's a lot of contact. So um, he's just not figured it out just yet, and we got a f pretty respectable sample size so far. So I want to get to some leverage there if I can. Hunter Brown, like I said, I'd rather probably pay an extra 1400 if I could make it happen and play him. At half the ownership, I think the spot's better. I think the offense on the other side is worse, even though they did just get Pete Alonso back last night. They don't hit for near as much power, right? And, and yeah, they're going to strike out just as often as Houston on the other side. But for the most part, they're not going to create. And even though Houston's numbers, raw creation against righties is basically it is worse, you know, don't get me wrong, um, you know, all of these numbers here are the same. But I think Hunter Brown's susceptibility is far less worrisome than Max Scherzer's, at least for me at the moment, right? 27% strikeout rates to both sides of the plate. He doesn't have the same kind of delta that Scherzer has, right? The walk rate is, yeah, higher, but like two ticks, 8.5% is not horrible or anything like that. 28% um, CSW is basically the same. 90 mile an hour average exit velo, you're talking one mile an hour of difference. Yeah, that's notable, but it's not like horrible. But the hard contact is far lower, really, to both sides of the plate. It's the same to the lefties. But he gets ground balls, right? That's the main difference here. It Hard contact we could deal with if you're getting this kind of ground ball rate out of it. Buck 80 ground ball to fly ball to the lefties, that's pretty damn good. Three and a half nearly ground ball to fly ball to the right side. And that's a hell of a lot better than 35% hard contact and 075 ground ball to fly ball for Scherzer, right? 50% fly balls and 35% hard contact is not good. But I like 28% hard contact and 18% fly balls. Like that, that's elite, right? So they're going to have lefties over here. Yeah, sure. But like I said, he's still getting ground balls, still striking them out. And still not getting hit for any power. 198 average allowed. 279 WOBA with a 116 ISO. With expected metrics, 233 XBA, 300 X WOBA, and a 125 X ISO. All in the same range, right? So th these are damn good numbers for Hunter Brown. I'd rather play him than Scherzer. Pay the extra 1400 if I can make it happen. If I had to choose between the two. So that's kind of where I stand on this. Do I want to go after Hunter Brown? Um, not really. I mean, there's some lefties over here, sure. Like a Frankie Lindor, yeah, go ahead. Uh, you can always play Pete Alonso, righties or lefties, doesn't really matter. He's giving up Hunter Brown a little bit more average to righties at 260, but not a lot of power, right? And a hell of a lot of ground ball. So really kind of a gulpy spot there to be playing some of the Mets. Um, so I'm not super interested here outside of maybe a, a an okay tournament Frankie Lindor or something like that. You can play Brandon Nimmo. You can play Jeff McNeil as filler pieces, whatever. Not a lot of power, though, from those guys. So, eh. Overall, I think I got to side with Houston here on the mound and in the batter's box a little bit. Scherzer, yeah, sure, I'll have a little bit uh, because of the high strikeout rate against righties. But overall, not all that impressive. Okay, let's move on to Merrill Kelly and Corbin Burns. D-backs and the Brewers. 9,600 for Merrill Kelly. Yeah, okay, whatever. I played him at this price before. No problem there. 17-point um, uh, projection so far. That's a you know, pretty respectable figure. 30 in the value score. It's fine. 28 and a half, you know, whatever. 20% ownership. We're starting to get it a little carried away, though, with Merrill Kelly. And I mentioned that every single starting pitcher here today has some attack ability. 
And with Merrill Kelly, it's 44% hard contact to left-handers. Now, he's also got a very high ground ball rate, buck 80 ground ball to fly ball. Uh, we could stomach 35, 36% hard contact with a 180 ground ball to fly ball here. That's fine. When it, once we get north of 40%, though, uh, all right, we got to start, you know, balking a little bit and be like, okay, let's slow down. Are we looking for a little bit of regression? I mean, well, I mean, we got a huge sample, 165 hitters against lefties for Merrill Kelly this season and an aggregate 44% hard contact. It's not like we're dealing with a short sample. It is a big number. He's getting so many ground balls that this is very attractive, and he stays off a line. So that those are good numbers, but I do not like this hard contact. Unfortunately for Milwaukee, that, who are they going to have to really capitalize on that? Yelich hits too many ground balls. He has a 2-0 ground ball to fly ball ratio himself against uh, right-handers, right? So that's no good, and he's 5,100. We don't really want to deal with that. Jesse Winker stinks, and he's probably going to get two at-bats and get pinch hit for um, when they bring in a lefty out of the pen. And then you got Rowdy Telez. He doesn't strike out a lot, but he's really not making a lot of hard contact anymore. And his numbers are just kind of average against right-handers. So um, he'll get the ball in the air, sure. So that would be my favorite play from the left side if I'm going to go after this, which kind of puts me on to Merrill Kelly. Even though I'm not jacked about a 20% ownership, I much prefer to play Merrill when he's not popular, unless the matchup is just like, excellent here and it's pretty good don't get me wrong I think this is perfectly fine to be going after the Brewers 25% K rate 90 WRC plus average hard contact average ISO etc etc I think this is fine they pop a lot of balls up it makes soft contact medium contact you know so I'm fine playing Merrill Kelly um, because they're going to be mostly right-handed heavy here and his numbers against righties are you know really uh, a good bit more balanced, at least in terms of the hard contact, right? 34% with ground balls, we can stomach that, as I mentioned. Um, he's right in line, though, production-wise, with where he should be based on the batted ball metrics. 156 X ISO, 315 X Woba, and a 235 XBA. And he's pretty, maybe running a little bit hot in those numbers, but it's not really more than 1% or 2% here or there. So that's well within, you know, standard deviations and variance ranges. So I'm okay playing Merrill Kelly. Um, if anything, we're looking for a little bit of negative regression, sure, because he's got a 10% walk rate and a 3.0 ERA with expected metrics, you know, half a run to a run higher than that. But once again, this is all well within normal variance range, and I'm okay playing him. I don't like the price tag, and I'm not super thrilled about the ownership, but I think it's an okay spot because I don't think Milwaukee's going to be able to attack him all that efficiently here. But this is a big, big number Hard contact-wise to the left side, don't get me wrong. Corbin Burns on the mound at 10,000, 36% ownership here. Now, it was this matchup that really got Corbin Burns going earlier in the year. Um, he got Arizona, and he went a full eight innings and struck out eight, right? Every uh, other outing than that, I mean, he's, had, he's really only had four super good outings. The other ones were against Kansas City, San Francisco, and Baltimore two starts ago, where he's gone deeper than six innings for the most part he's having trouble going longer than six now it's been a pretty consistent six for the most part start here or there where he just goes five five and a third whatever when he jacks up his pitch count um but Corbin Burns can do that and when we eat a lot of ownership on him we normally want to do it I'm more comfortable doing it with very left-handed heavy lineups that strike out and although Arizona is going to be pretty left-handed heavy here tonight, they do not strike out. And it's going to make it a lot more difficult for Corbin Burns because they've got a couple of righties in here that hit righties well. We'll get to the split in a second. But against lefties, that's where we really want to play Burns because his cutter is so, so good. He's got an excellent change up here as well. And this two-pitch combination is really the moneymaker for him. Um inducing soft contact and a lot of ground balls against the left side 2 ground ball 215 ground ball to fly ball to lefties with no line drives 20 percent hard with a 23 percent soft contact rate that's the change up in the cutter really going to work here 062 iso with a 26 percent k rate that those are elite figures so we don't want a lot of lefties against him normally unless they're going to hit the baseball on a line and in the air and not strike out now, that's, that's Corbin Carroll territory. Uh, Cattell Marte, he'll whiff a little bit. 
Um, I don't really want to go after him at, at 4,700 and, and play a lot of him, but he's he's in play here. Jerry Perdomo probably going to strike out a little bit, uh, but he's probably going to lead him off. Um, will the D-backs? I, I think that's an okay play at 35. I generally don't want lefties, though, because the numbers are, are so, so good. Um, I would mostly like right-handers here. 245 average allowed. It's about 10 points higher here, or 100 points higher. Um you know, 10 percentage points than it is to lefty. 320 Woba, same deal, 100 points higher, 189 ISO. I mean, that's 130 or 120 points higher to the right side, and the strikeout rate is four ticks lower. Walk rate's better, yeah, but he gives up an 065 ground ball to fly ball to the righties. This is a monster, monster delta here, 37% hard contact. So if we're going after Corbin Burns, He's got a 24% line drive rate to the righties. It's not with lefties. We want right-handers that can hit the baseball on the line, and that's Christian Walker, that's Lourdes Gurriel, and that's even Carson Kelly um, behind the plate. So I think those are pretty damn good plays. You can always play Corbin Carroll, and you can always play Cattell Marte because he hits from both sides. He's got good numbers. But I think an Arizona stack is very sneaky here tonight. They've got a couple righties I really like getting to in – downside of the platoon matchups like uh, Chris Walker and Lourdes Gurriel. They got a lot of power against righties. Um, and, and Lourdes has been fantastic this season. So I want to play a couple of Arizona stacks on the other side. Nobody's going to play them. And surprisingly, they're not popping or, you know, Corbin Burns isn't popping as hard against them, right? It's not depressing their projection, their aggregate projections, as much as you'd think when you see Corbin Burns and the highest projection on the day and 36% ownership, et cetera, et cetera, right? So I think this is a little bit of a dangerous spot for Burns, and I'd probably prefer to play, I'd definitely prefer to play Hunter Brown against the Mets in, in what's a similar strikeout matchup, but the Mets are a worse offense. Um, and Hunter Brown doesn't have near the same susceptibility here that Corbin Burns does. So he's my choice, Hunter Brown. And I would like to get off of some of this ownership for Corbin Burns. I think it's a bad idea if you totally fade the guy. Um, so I probably won't be doing that. But I want to have some coverage on the other side against Arizona because he, he's he been picked apart by them in the past, too. I remember one start last season um, against Arizona. Yeah, it was last season in September. Five and two-thirds, seven hits, five earned runs, struck out just five. Um, when he was very popular, I don't have the number off the top of my head, but he was very popular. I remember this start because I stacked against him. So, um, in any case, I want to get to some D backs here and some Merrill Kelly for sure. I'll have some burns definitely, but I'm really kind of off of Milwaukee for the most part. I don't like any of their hitters. I don't really like the matchup for them necessarily outside of Rowdy. Um, so that puts me on to Merrill. And, you know, we'll just have to see where we land. I'm not wild about his price tag, though. Okay, let's uh, finish this up here. Michael Waka going for the Padres in what's going to be a bullpen game for the Giants. We'll get to that in a sec. Waka at 8,300. I think this is playable. 8,300. It's fine price tag. He's got a really damn good changeup. Now, the value on it's uh, fluctuating a little bit, starting to come down not at the two and three outs above average that it was earlier in the year, but it's still a very, very good pitch. It's always been his best pitch. We talk about this every day with Michael Walka. Good value on a four-seamer, two-seamer mix, too. So he's got three and even four pitches now with the curveball where he's getting value. He wish he'd just stop throwing this cutter and not try, not deal with it, right, because he throws this to right-handers for some stupid reason. He still throws some of the two-seamer to left-handers for some stupid reason. Um, and the, and the cutter, like, it gives up an out and a half to the field because he throws it to the right, and it gets over the barrel. And that's why we see a lower strikeout rate here to the right side, more hard contact, and more, um, you know, flattened batted ball profile with an 080 ground ball to fly ball. He gets far more fly balls against the left side because it's weak contact, 22% soft versus just 25% hard contact to lefties. That's because of the changeup and the curveball getting weak contact and, and balls popped up in the air. So um, I think this is a playable spot for him against the Giants because they're going to go lefty heavy, of course. We know that they like to play the platoon. Lamont Wade, Jock, Conforto, Yaz. They'll have Bailey. Uh, Crawford will probably be in there tonight. Um, 
they've got Blake Sabol, et cetera, et cetera. A ton of lefties here that they'll like to probably try and platoon. So we'll see what they want to do. The one thing that would kind of take me off of Michael Walker is the fly balls, right? And the fact is there's a 15-mile-an-hour wind blowing out to right center in San Francisco. Now, it, it there's not a huge advantage for wind in San Francisco, normally because it's only 50 freaking degrees there every night, and this is still a night game where it's only 50 or 60 degrees. Um, but it, you know, 15, 20 mile an hour wind, like, you gotta start to take notice of that. And these hitters over here can't get the baseball in the air, and Michael Waka gives up fly balls. So, sure. Um, we can play a little bit of that, but Batted ball wise, I since the fly ball rate is so heavy to the left side of the plate, I'd probably still just side with Walker here because of the really, really good changeup. So I think he's very much in play, and I mostly like the combination here of the high fly ball rate, good changeup, and low ownership. Price tag's good. I'm not I'm you know, kind of lukewarm on the projection so far. I think it may be a little bit low. Um you know, but like whatever. He's got four pitches here that are above league average, right? And I wish he'd just not throw this cutter. But for the most part, everything is pretty damn good here for Michael Walker this season. And nothing all too exploitable. 175 X ISO, 315 X Woba, and a 245 XBA. It's all pretty damn good numbers. Now, he does have a 290 ERA with expected metrics about a run, run and a half higher than that. High strand rate. So if he's going to put people on base, that's probably where the regression is going to come. These guys will just circle around and, and come around to score. But like I said, he induces soft contact, and I and he gets a lot of balls popped up, um, mostly in the platoon matchup, and that's how the Giants are going to try to attack here. So I think Michael Walk is certainly in play. If you want to go after him, though, it, I think that's okay, too, because the Giants are still very high upside tournament stack, as always, because the only thing they do is hit the ball over the wall, 180 ISO, 25% K rate, and they walk. So they're patient. If Waka walks a couple of pe- a couple of people, then you know it really doesn't take a lot for yeah. You know, I mean, Jock Peterson still hits you know change up or not, still hits right-handers at some of the the highest numbers in the league, some of the best uh, split-adjusted figures for Jock. Same with Conforto and same with Yaz. They all hit righties still very well, despite you know Waka having a good uh, change up here. I think that's that's playable. All it takes is, you know, put a guy on base for free, bl- then a bloop, right? And then, um, you know, Conforto hits a two-run dinger, and, you know, that's all she wrote. In any case, ball pu- uh, bullpen game here for the Giants. It's likely to be Ryan Walker opening for them. He's a righty. Um, just making his debut, I believe, uh, since John Brebbia is out. He's not going to go all that long, and then they're likely to have Jake Junis come in. He's attackable. He's only going to go three innings. So um, you've been able to do this a couple of times this season where the Giants have, have let their long reliever actually, you know, go four innings, five innings, notably with like a Sean Manaya a couple of times. Can't do it here with Jake Junis. He's only going to go about three, I believe, and he's 6,400, not great. And he gives up a lot of hard contact still with a lot of power. So I think the Padres are very much in play here tonight. Tatis, for sure, he'd probably be my favorite. Then Soto. Um, but I mean, they're, you know, one in one a here. I like M- Manny Machado as well at 5,000, very playable 4,900 for Xander. Not so much, but, uh, Jake Junis has historically given up a lot of hard contact and power to the right side too. And we can see that here this season and in, in his 19 appearances, 118 hitters, 298 average allowed 365 Woba and a 202 ISO to righties with North of 32% hard contact. So let's do it. He's a neutral ground ball to fly ball guy. You can play everybody from the Padres uh, in the top half of the lineup, notably. But you could play Gary Sanchez and Matt Carpenter as well. Not jacked about a Hasa Kim or Trent Grisham necessarily um, at their price tags, and Grisham just stinks. But there's upside here because Junis still gives up a lot of hard contact to lefties. 38% this year. Neutral ground ball to fly ball. 277 ISO allowed there. So there's some strikeouts for Junis, uh, mostly against the right side. But, you know, the Padres, for the most part, not going to strike out a whole hell of a lot. Tatis will, but Machado and Bogarts, not so much. Soto, you know, not so much either, right? So uh, I like getting to a, a late slate 
sort of Padres hammer here, and you can play some offense because, as I mentioned, there's 50 mile an hour wind blowing out, and you got a guy that's going to give up some balls on a line here, Jake Junis, really to both sides of the plate. So give me some of the Padres, um, even in 60 degree weather. I'm not worried about uh, the power suppression for these guys necessarily. So yeah, sign me up. Um, some sneaky offense from the Giants, perhaps, but Waka mostly in the Padres, I think. And they're basically picking the betting markets, you know, dollar fifteen for the Padres here. I think this is playable. Um, I think you can go after, and I think it's a pretty damn good number to get if you can get it in the betting markets. Okay, so about an hour, unfortunately, um, because I yap. So let's go over a review here real quick. Cubs Pittsburgh, Cubs mostly, I think, against Beto, uh, but you can play some. Uh, Pittsburgh pieces, notably like Connor Joe, McCutcheon, Cabrian Hayes, Rody Castro. All these guys are in play, I think. Smiley also in play at 6500 at a cheap price tag. Big ballpark here, uh, despite warm weather. Colorado, Cincinnati, we have rain here we got to worry about. Brandon Williamson in play because at the price tag. Austin Gomber, even at the price tag, not in play. I do like the Rockies, and I, I do like the, the, the Reds, of course. Um, it's just ownership you got to balance with them. But I think getting to a piece here or there with Colorado is very much in play here. Uh, this small ballpark is going to play up their power a little bit more than um, than like a, a Coors Field or something like that. Boston, Minnesota, mostly just pitching here, I think. Paxton and Pablo Lopez, I think both of these guys are in play. I like Paxton a good bit here against Minnesota. They strike out a crap load. 28% K rate against lefties, um, even when they, they've got you know eight, nine righties in the list. Pablo, of course... Sure, like you can play him definitely uh, against Boston here. He's going to have a, a tougher time striking them out a lot, so that's why I prefer Paxton. But you can get to some, like these guys will be popular, so you can get to some offensive pieces as well where they're well-priced. Texas, absolutely, every day, because this is going to be likely a bullpen game for the White Sox. Um, so give me all of Texas. Give me Semyon, give me Seager, give me Garcia, give me Nate Lowe, give me... Did everybody uh, top to bottom White Sox too though against Andrew Heaney he's got a little his arsenal is just break even right and the White Sox are going to go very right handed heavy that's certainly the downside of the platoon for Heaney um, so I think they're playable and very well priced Mets Houston over here not really jacked about the Mets I like a lot of Hunter Brown and I like some Houston against Max Scherzer I'll have some but I think he's probably a bit too popular at the moment, given his underlying metrics. He's got to prove that he's still Max Scherzer. Now, 30% K rate is going to put you on to him because they're going to be so right-handed heavy here tonight, but he's given up a lot of pop to righties this year, too, so keep that in mind. Hunter Brown, though, I really like against the Mets. Um, it's not really often that I say, but this offense just stinks. Arizona-Milwaukee. Arizona's super shrewd tournament play here tonight, getting leverage on Cor Corbin Burns. I like him, too, because he's got really damn good numbers. He's a good arm. But I think I'd have to side with Arizona if I had to choose um, and just play Hunter Brown in Arizona. You know, I like that. I think that's a, a pretty cool tournament build, though. Merrill Kelly as well, because Milwaukee just stinks, and they've got bad batted ball profile matchups against Merrill Kelly, um, you know, from the left side of the plate where he's most attackable. San Diego and San Francisco offense, too, a little bit. And no Jake Junis can't really do anything here in the bullpen game with the Giants on the mound. But Michael Walker is certainly in play. And you can play some San Francisco pieces, but I'm more on the Padres going after Junis and the bullpen arms of San Francisco. So that's it for the breakdown. Once again, keep an eye out for projections updates as, as we got to flesh out all this uh, ownership nonsense. And good luck to everybody here on this Monday 7-Gamer.